Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for the role of international climate finance, the third briefing in a five-part series, What Congress Needs to Know in the lead up to COP26. I'm Dan Brissett, Executive Director of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. We're within two weeks of the start of the 26th Conference of Parties to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, or COP26. ESI has devoted the entire month of October to providing briefings and related educational resources with the information and insights policymakers and their staff need in the lead up to during and after COP26. I would like to start by acknowledging our honorary co-sponsor, the British Embassy of Washington, and our great partner, the Henry M. Jackson Foundation, for their support and cooperation that make this briefing series possible. The Environmental and Energy Study Institute was founded in 1984 on a bipartisan basis by members of Congress to provide science-based information about environmental, energy, and climate change topics to policymakers. More recently, we've also developed a program to provide technical assistance to rural utilities interested in on-bill financing programs for their customers. EESI provides informative, objective, nonpartisan coverage of climate change topics in briefings, written materials, on social media, all of our educational resources, including briefing recordings, fact sheets, issue briefs, articles, newsletters, and podcasts are always available for free online at www.eesi.org. The best way to stay informed about our latest educational resources is to subscribe to our biweekly newsletter, Climate Change Solutions. And as part of our focus of, on COP26, for the first time, we will publish a special daily newsletter during the climate talks, Glasgow Dispatch to help Congress keep updated on developments at these critical negotiations. You can subscribe for this daily newsletter online at www.eesi.org forward slash COP news. Our briefing series began on October 8th with a conversation featuring Sir Robert Watson and Christiana Figueres, who discussed the imperative for urgent climate action and they shared a hopeful outlook for COP26 and beyond. If you missed this briefing, you can review presentation materials and watch the archived webcast at www.eesi.org. And last week, we convened a panel of climate adaptation and resilience experts who shared an update on initiatives undertaken or expanded since the last meeting of the Conference of Parties in 2019. Coming up on Friday, October 22nd, we will look ahead to the negotiations and review the major issues to resolve as countries move ahead with their nationally determined contributions for greenhouse gas emissions reductions. And after COP26, on Thursday, November 18th, we will convene a briefing for an after action report about key outcomes and possible next steps. Today, though, is all about international climate finance. And to help get us started, I am very pleased to welcome Kate Hughes, Director for International Climate Change with the Department for Business, Energy, and Industrial Strategy of the United Kingdom. Kate leads teams supporting clean energy transitions, green finance, sustainable supply chains, and increasing the uptake of electric vehicles. The United Kingdom will assume the COP presidency and is hosting COP26 in Glasgow. And Kate would like to share some introductory remarks with us today before we convene our panel. Kate, welcome. It's thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thank you very much. And thank you for inviting me and for that introduction. So yeah, I'm gonna give you a bit of an introduction, hopefully set the context uh, for today's uh, conversations. Um, and say a bit about climate finance, 100 billion, and a bit on the UK experience as well. So public international climate finance has got a really important role to play in reducing global emissions, in supporting countries to adapt and become resilient to climate change, and also in influencing the negotiating dynamics at COPs, particularly this one. It can have huge impact, value for money and reach, and it's really catalytic in enabling ambitious climate action and in mobilizing trillions of dollars from a wide range of sources that's going to be really fundamental to uh, the scope and scale of this climate transition that we need. As COP26 presidency, we really welcome President Biden's commitment made at UNGA to work with Congress to double US climate finance above the levels he set in April, aiming to reach $11.4 billion annually by financial year 24. And we recognise the important role Congress plays in supporting this ambition and appropriating this climate finance annually. The COP presidency calls on you to work with the administration to scale up climate finance over the next three years in a way that maximises its impact in meeting global emissions reduction goals and supporting vulnerable countries to adapt to the impacts of climate change. 
So a bit of context. Climate finance is one of three key pillars of the Paris Agreement, and countries agreed back in Copenhagen in 2009 to collectively mobilise at least $100 billion annually of climate finance to support developing and emerging economies to reach their climate goals. This was reaffirmed in Paris and also agreed that the goal would run through to 2025. And as COP presidency, we're working with countries to reach that goal. This commitment of support from developed countries was made alongside securing the agreement that all countries would put forward nationally determined contributions, underpinning the understanding that all parties are responsible for being as ambitious with their mitigation actions as possible. Demonstrating sufficient progress on the 100 billion goal is critical to refocusing pressure on high emitting emerging economies to put forward sufficiently ambitious emissions reduction goals and in providing the finance to support this transition. And it's a necessary condition for developing and emerging economies to engage constructively in the COP26 negotiations. So in terms of UK climate finance and our approach, we have committed to doubling our own climate finance to £11.6 billion pounds between 21 and 2025, with a balance between mitigation and adaptation. Now, we've increased our climate finance because it's the right thing to do because of those commitments, but also we see it as in our own national interest. Meeting our international climate finance commitments will require us to spend just a fraction of what we are already spending domestically on our transition. And we know that when the world moves, it will make it quicker, cheaper and easier to deliver on our own net zero targets, as well as those global net zero targets. Climate finance is integral to safeguarding the development progress we have all made in the past decades. All of the investments we have made will be reversed if we don't invest in tackling climate change. We also see it as integral um, and essential to safeguarding our national security. We've all seen increased conflict and migration due to climate change induced drought, crop failure, natural disasters. And this will only increase if we can't support countries to adapt to climate change. And finally, green markets are the markets of the future. The UK is growing the green industries of the future, and we want to support the development of those markets for these industries for decades to come. So the role of public finance is really important, not just in uh, those things that I outlined, but also mobilising and uh, catalyzing the trillions that we know are needed in order to get us to global net zero. In supporting the most vulnerable, jump-starting those markets, de-risking investments, but we know it can't fund the transition alone. And in Article 2.1c of the Paris Agreement, all parties committed to making finance flows consistent with a pathway towards low greenhouse gas and climate resilient development. This is needed to catalyze those trillions needed to address climate change, but it's also gonna require a fundamental shift in the global financial system. International public finance has a fundamental role to play in this shift, whether it's technical assistance to help set the regulatory and investment environment, or as that capital risk bearing tranche. And we've got huge numbers of examples of where UK public finance has catalyzed billions from the private sector, has radically reduced the cost of technologies and shown that pathway to investment that can then be followed without the need for public finance. So it's really great to see there's a variety of vehicles out there for climate finance in the Senate and House draft appropriations bills, including technical assistance through USAID and the State Department for Renewable Energy, Sustainable Landscapes and Adaptation, as well as contributions to multilateral funds, including the GCF, the Green Climate Fund, the GEF, the Global Environment Facility, and the Climate Investment Fund, the CIFs. There's lots of acronyms in this area. These are all essential mechanisms in the climate finance landscape. But I want to specifically point out the value of two funds very briefly, the GCF and the CIFs. So the GCF, given its demand-driven approach, is a key part of supporting developing countries to access funds for impactful projects and mobilising funds at scale to implement their NDCs, so their National Adaptation Plans, and other nationally driven sustainable development strategies. The fact that the GCF has programmed well over $3 billion in climate projects since the beginning of the pandemic is a huge success. It's available to all countries, provides support across all areas of mitigation and adaptation, and provides technical assistance. The flexibility and breadth of its work is crucial to those long-term transformations. And we recognise the need to keep on improving the GCF's efficiency and increasing its impact. 
Alongside this, the CIFs, the Climate Investment Fund's sector-specific programmatic approach plays a really important and complementary role to the GCF. The CIFs disperse relatively quickly. They work in a streamlined fashion and have a strong track record on blended finance. They've used donor finance to mobilise nine times that amount in additional public MDB and private funding. And we are particularly excited for the joint UK-US leadership in the new Accelerating Coal Transitions programme, which we believe can play a key role in supporting a just and rapid transition for emerging economies dependent on coal to grow instead their clean energy economies. So with an issue as complex and wide ranging as climate change, we need a variety of solutions and interventions. There's definitely no one size fits all approach, but public finance plays a truly catalytic role here. Donors have to work together to maximize impact and we need to understand the needs of developing countries. And while there are quick wins, we also need to provide that predictability and transparency of climate finance so that we can ensure that countries have the certainty to act in the transformative way needed. Thank you. Thank you, Kate, for that. And um, thanks for joining us today um, at the outset of our briefing. And I'm very pleased that you'll be joining us um, later after our panel um, to participate in our Q&A. So thank you very much for that. Um, and as we transition to our panel, um, I would like to call back to something that we discussed on Friday during our briefing, the significant unmet need for finance to address the many challenges of adaptation and helping communities, especially those on the front lines and disproportionately affected by the effects of global warming, improve their resilience. And specifically, we talked on Friday about the idea that not only do we need to mobilize great quantities of dollars to meet the urgency of climate change for adaptation and mitigation, but also that our investments and resources need to use to finance climate change solutions have to be high quality. They have to be high enough quality to ensure that benefits are delivered in an equitable way to maximize the impact of each dollar or pound spent and put into effect and help put into effect a just transition to a decarbonized clean energy global economy. Taken separately, those are very tall orders and together, well, you can understand why we're devoting an entire briefing to exploring these topics. I'm really looking forward to our conversation. Before I introduce our first panelist, I'd like to um, let everyone know in our audience that while we'll have the Q&A um, and we'll still have an opportunity for you to participate, um, even though you won't be joining us in the Zoom. For those of you watching on, on website, on our website or on YouTube, you can still ask us questions. We have two options for doing that. The first is by following us on Twitter at EESI online. You can also send us an email. The email address to use is ask, A-S-K, at EESI.org. If you have questions, uh, please feel free to send them our way, and we'll do our best to incorporate them into the discussion. Um, and now let me introduce our panel. Our first panelist is Bella Tonka Tonkanogi. She is a sustainable finance expert who leads the Climate Policy Initiative's US-based team. Since joining CPI, she has played a leading role in the Global Innovation Lab for Clim Climate fi Finance through serving on the core management and strategy team, supporting the development of innovative climate finance instruments in renewable energy, climate risk, and forestry, and understanding the lab's impact. Bella also develops and guides key CPI programs and initiatives, such as the City's Climate Finance Leadership Alliance, and manages projects to improve the effectiveness of climate finance more broadly. Bella, welcome to our panel today. I'm really looking forward to your presentation. Great, thank you so much, Dan. It's uh, really a pleasure to be here today. So um, just to introduce a little bit CPI. So we are an analysis and advisory organization. Uh, we work with governments, businesses, and financial institutions to drive economic growth while addressing climate change. And our main, um, our main deep expertise is in climate finance and policy. So thank you all so much again. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. So what I'm gonna talk about today, three things. So first, what is climate finance? Second, why does international climate finance matter? We heard a little bit about that from Kate, so I'm just gonna add a little bit to that. And then finally, how do we make public climate investment effectively? So first, what is climate finance? So I just wanna start by saying climate finance is about making real investments. It's about real economy, about enabling activities that mitigate climate change or support adaptation to climate change. 
This can mean clean energy, it could be land use, disaster risk management, cities, resilient infrastructure, sustainable energy access. It runs quite a wide gamut of investment opportunities. Then it's important to understand what, we're, what we mean when we talk about climate finance because different people come with different perspectives and they, they may call something climate finance that another person might think is, a, is defining it in a different way. So there are a few ways that we have defined climate finance. So sort of at the, the narrowest scope is what we're talking about today, which is international public climate finance. These are flows that go from developed countries to developing countries to support climate out of action in those countries. A little bit more broadly thinking about climate finance, we can also think about public fi climate finance more broadly. So this is in addition to international public climate finance, these are domestic climate finance flows. This is the, our national governments, our local governments investing in projects in their own country. This is actually a bigger category of climate finance. And then finally, zooming out again, we can talk about private climate finance. And that's the investments that commercial banks are making, that, that uh, institutional investors are making, that corporations are making, and that you and I are making when we purchase energy efficient appliances or battery electric vehicles. So CPI takes the totality, that whole box, when we assess what we call global climate finance flows to really understand and draw a picture of what is happening around the world in terms of climate finance. So I'm just gonna to present to you some of that data today just to give you the context for the discussion. So first, let me present to you a, a, what we call a Sankey diagram, which, in which shows the life cycle of climate investment. So this is something that we have produced since 2011. Um, what you can see on the top is that we have um, for 2019 and 2020, we have counted $632 billion of investment annually. That's an average across 2019 and 2020. And this data is actually recently released. We've just released it on Monday. So moving from left to right, you can see the sources of the climate finance. So the public sector in blue, the private sector in orange. You can see the uses of that or the instruments of that climate finance and so what are grants, what's going through as um, either con concessional or market rate debt, and then in terms of equity, as well as balance sheet financing. Then you move again to the right and you see the uses of that finance between mitigation and adaptation. And finally, the destination uh, in terms of sectors of that finance whether it's going to renewable energy, land use, water, and wastewater. Let me just dive into a little bit more those results. So in this last study that we just released on Monday, we found that mitigation finance continues to dominate globally with over a 90% share of total climate finance. So of that renewable energy around the world is the highest share of mitigation finance. And uh, a majority of that is privately financed, reflecting the, um, the commercialization of renewable energy in many, many countries. The next category is transportation finance. What we're seeing is that um, transportation finance is growing faster than renewable energy finance right now, and that's largely accounted for by the growth in battery electric vehicles around the world. And then what we see in terms of adaptation finance is that it is a small share of total climate finance, about 7%. Almost all of that is financed by public actors. It is increasing. Um, it increased actually by 50% from our last study, 2017, 2018, but it is still a small overall share. Now, climate finance globally is growing. Um, it has been growing through the course of our study, which, has, which started in 2011. Um, but what we are seeing right now is that that climate finance is actually, the growth is slowing. So you're seeing almost a plateauing of climate finance year on year. It only increased 10% from our last study um, versus previous year on year uh, growth rates of closer to 25%. 
And this is especially worrying because we're not seeing yet COVID-19's impact on climate finance, which we expect to observe in the next couple years. We also see that climate finance is still a, is still a small portion of the total investment needed to actually limit global warming to 1.5 C. So there's still a significant gap when you zoom out of the year on year numbers and compare to the investment needs, there's a very significant gap for a successful low carbon transition. And that is, uh, that is paralleled in adaptation finance where current adaptation finance flows fall well short of estimated annual needs through 2030. So let's then talk about why international climate finance matters. This is, I wanted to present to you the context in which international public climate finance sits. So why does it matter? Kate mentioned a number of, um, of reasons that it matters. First, climate change stands to reverse many of the development gains that countries have made. And that is a standalone point. But from a US-centric perspective, that can also contribute to increasing instability globally. It can affect the US directly, for example, via supply chain disruptions. And we've already become far too familiar with the consequences of that right now in this post-COVID economy. Second, also from a US perspective, for us to be able to meet global climate change goals, we need action from developing countries. So this figure on the right is taken from some modeled results where they show that 39% of the effort needs to come from, uh, from developing countries, including India and smaller emitting developing countries. So that does not, that 39% does not include China, which is another 30%. So from a climate perspective and resulting economic perspective, the US will be impacted if developing countries can't reduce their emissions. So then what do we know about climate finance flows that are going to these countries that need to act uh, both on mitigation and adaptation? Well, I think what you can see in this chart is that the vast majority of climate finance flows are concentrated in East Asia and Pacific, which is really China, uh, Western Europe and US and Canada. And you can, I, the other thing you can see is that for those three regions, the vast, vast majority of climate finance flows are domestic. But when you look at Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, Latin America, and Caribbean and Central Asia, they're far more dependent on international finance flows, those dark, the dark red um, uh, bars in the, in the bar chart. So for those regions, about half of their climate finance is coming from abroad, that's both public and private investment. And so if we want those countries to act, this is where international climate finance is um, absolutely critical. These are the regions that it targets. Um, and without this international climate finance, we're going to have a much, uh, these regions are gonna have a much more challenging time of reaching their targets. So let me just finish by talking about effectiveness in public investment. Um, so when we think about the climate investment gap and kind of thinking about this context of overall climate finance and the, the rectangle that is international public climate finance, we can understand first that public sources do need to increase further. There's a massive investment gap, especially for developing countries, but there, those sources are not going to scale to the levels needed. So public finance together with public policy also needs to increase its effectiveness, both at mobilizing private investment, so shifting those trillions, as well as supporting the most vulnerable countries that have the highest climate risks and the lowest capacity to address them. And so here on this slide, I've just put a few areas where I think that those public resources can be most effectively deployed. So first, an enabling environment, areas like policy reform, market uh, environment, um, developing directly project pipelines, so actually helping countries and cities and project developers develop adequate pipeline for investment. And then finally, for finance, 
financing vehicles themselves, really using the uh, public sources of finance to de-risk investment, for example, in early stage technologies or first time deployments or to address some of the, um, the risks that are very prevalent in developing countries, for example, um, uh, local currency risk. And that this, this finance, this public finance, as Kate mentioned, is really delivered by diversity of sources and diversity of instruments from the multilateral development banks, from bilateral DFIs like the US DFC, from bilateral aid agencies like USAID. They all have a role to play. And the most important thing is that they work together. So let me just end uh, by talking, just bringing it back to reality, uh, out of the abstract and back to the ground. So, you know, why do we work on international climate finance? This is a company that I worked with a couple of years ago through the Global Innovation Lab for Climate Finance. It's called Kamaza. And what they're doing in Kenya is that they are, they work with smallholder farmers to help them plant trees so that, um, those trees can be used as sources for um, local wood and, um, and other paper products. It can help to restore degraded land and it can help diversify the income sources of those farmers. And what this company is trying to do is scale up. Forestry is a very risky business anywhere, especially in developing countries. In Kenya, um, commercial debt is very expensive. And so this company has come up with a new way to finance their business model, which is basically to refinance their trees. And they have a really interesting US connections. Their founder is from the US. They're, they have a number of US investors. They are um, uh, planning to submit a project to the Green Climate Fund for approval. And they have huge impact in terms of the number of farmers that they are reaching, the number of hectares that they are planting, the advanced technology that they're bringing to Kenya. And these are the kinds of investments that really will make a difference in many, many countries and really is why we uh, undertake and really support international climate finance. So thank you so much and back over to you, Dan. Thank you, Bella, for that excellent presentation. Um, it's always nice um, when the first speaker has such great slides because that is a great reminder to me to remind everyone in our audience that um, in addition to the webcast being available online after today's briefing, so will all of the presentation materials um, as well as links to all of the organizations um, that our panelists represent. So if you'd like to go back and look at Bella's slides in a little bit more detail, um, you can always do that by visiting us online at www.esi.org because they were very good slides. Um, our next panelist is Ricardo Noguera. He is an expert on climate finance, international development, and sustainable investing. Rick's clients include major philanthropies, governments, and multilateral development banks. Rick is also a member of the board of Washington, D.C.'s Green Finance Authority, the first municipal green bank in the United States. And Rick is a member of the Green Climate Fund's Independent Technical Advisor Panel which advises the GCF board on all funding decisions. Rick, welcome. Um, nice to see you today, and I'm looking forward to your presentation. Thank you very much, Dan. Hopefully, um, just to confirm, everybody can see the slides. Yep, they look great. Great. So may, maybe at the outset, uh, as Dan mentioned, I'm, I'm part of the Independent Technical Advisory Panel, GCF, which effectively acts as a cross between an investment committee and an advisory board where we look at the uh, proposals that the GCF is considering funding and provide kind of an independent view on them. So I, I note that because at the outset, I just want to say that um, uh, my presentation today, as well as any responses I may have for questions are, are wholly my own and not the GCFs, uh, notwithstanding that I do have a professional connection uh, to them. Uh, but what I want to do over the next 12 minutes uh, or so is uh, just to provide some of the basics of what the Green Climate Fund is and how it came to be and what the history of it is. Uh, but uh, it's very much uh, a superficial touching on it and there's lots more information available on the GCF website, which I encourage you to look at. It's actually quite transparent of a website with uh, loads of information on the projects that they support as well as their processes. So um, the, the concept of the GCF really came out of the Copenhagen COP 
uh, back in uh, 2010, as, as Kate mentioned in her opening remarks, you know, there were a few financial pillars uh, that were established then that really paved the kind of diplomatic path to the, to the Paris Agreement a few years down the road. Uh, and one of them, in addition to the 100 billion uh, commitment, uh, uh, one big one was establishing a sole purpose international funding vehicle uh, to support developing countries uh, uh, meet their climate ambitions. And that is what the Green Climate Fund was. Um, it, the, the basic premise behind it is that the world will continue to develop, including developing countries. Uh, roads will be built, cities will grow, population will grow. And the trick is to figure out how to make sure that that's happening in a way that's compatible with the climate crisis. So shifting that paradigm of growth uh, uh, to reflect the need for a low carbon future and a more resilient future. Um, so the concept broadly was that. Uh, another major driver, and I'll touch upon it in a little detail later, for more detail later, was uh, there was a uh, there was a, a feeling from developing countries that what was needed was a vehicle that was demand driven, meaning uh, that the projects that they were funding and the activities that were being supported were those that developing countries themselves identified as being aligned with their needs. Uh, there was a sense, rightfully or wrongfully, that uh, often uh, climate finance from the past, if it was coming from multilaterals or bilateral, had a little bit of a top-down feel to it. Here would be a vehicle that they would have a stronger uh, voice in. So um, once, once it was agreed to establish this, work began immediately on coming up with a governing instrument, which is effectively the charter, the constitution. Uh, these concepts that I mentioned in terms of country ownership, in terms of paradigm shift, are, and others are reflected there. And then they moved to a first board meeting in 2012. So as you see, it, it was quite rapid. You also had to build the human capacity around this institution. Um, so the Green Climate Fund itself, uh, the team that runs it, it's roughly maybe nearing 200 folks today, is based in Songdo, Korea, so just outside of Seoul. Uh, and all that was happening through the early parts of the of the 20 teens, right? So this is coming up with the rules of the road, how the GCF was going to operate, and then building out its its teams and building out its structure. Once that became robust enough, the GCF received its first pledges of funding. Um, in total, it was a little over uh, 10 billion uh, in U.S. dollars, 10.4 billion. In US dollars, the US under the Obama administration pledged uh, 3 billion as part of that amount. Uh, uniquely, and reflecting where the thinking was going internationally on climate finance and, and eventually reflected in the Paris Agreement itself, is those pledges came from all sorts of countries, not just those that were deemed to, to be developed countries back in 1992 when the UNFCCC was put together but really kind of a broader set of countries. And I believe it was either nine or 10 developing countries ended up participating uh, in that pledge. Uh, and once, uh, once the pledge was in place, the, the fund immediately started working on approving projects. And in fact, the very, very first set of project approvals happened uh, just before uh, the final Paris negotiations got underway. Uh, so it was a rapid, rapid growth uh, from uh, concept to operations uh, with lots of learning built in, and it is a continuing learning and improving uh, entity. Uh, and as they continue to deploy capital in 2019, uh, the GCF has gone back for its first replenishment. Uh, of funding and has run that process and has raised an additional 9.4, roughly $9.4 billion. So what has it done with the money? Um, so this is, it just came out actually a couple of weeks ago, the GCF put out um, kind of a summary of where the funding has gone. Uh, and as you see, they, you know, they've touched upon um, uh, over a hundred plus developing countries. They've approved projects uh, in about the 10 billion mark. Uh, and when the approval project, you know, as you've heard in some of the earlier discussions, often this funding is intended to mobilize other sources of funding. So they have uh, typically have co-financing or expect to mobilize funding from other sources, uh, which is about 27 um, additional billion dollars uh, uh, as part of that 10 billion. 
Um, and uh, in total, 139 projects today have been uh, approved. This gives you a sense of where the projects are located, so across the developing countries, uh, developing world. Uh, and above, you, you kind of get a sense of the mix between adaptation, mitigation, and cross-cutting, which means that there's an aspect of mitigation and adaptation in that project. So uh, I'm going to go take a step back and kind of talk a little bit about what makes the GCF unique and some of the things you've seen in the earlier slides will maybe make you know, more sense. Uh, in my mind, I think there are maybe four things that stand out at the GCF, both from its genesis and the way it operates now. One is the concept of being country owned or demand driven. Uh, and that really means that in its governance design, as well as its operational design, uh, the, the onus and is on developing countries in terms of determining what they believe they need. And then the decision making at the GCF level is very much a shared endeavor between developing developed countries. I'll give you maybe three kind of examples. One is uh, there's a board. Uh, that runs the GCF, that is the ultimate decision maker. It's made up of 24 seats, which are evenly split between developed and developing country by the charter of the GCF itself. So there's 12 developing seats, developing country seats and 12 developed country seats. Uh, and for the most part, they, uh, they try to operate in consensus. And for a long time, that was actually the rules of the GCF that the decision making was made at a consensus level. So that gives developing countries a much, much stronger voice uh, in how the vehicle is established and what sort of things get funded than, than, uh, than other uh, international uh, climate finance efforts. efforts. Uh, a second area that is absolutely uh, critical and unique to the GCF, it's, it's, and I'm skipping down to the bottom uh, here, it's its focus on adaptation, or at least the role that adaptation finance plays. Uh, as you heard from Bella, Adaptation is a relatively small part of total uh, international climate finance, but it's, but it's a critical part in terms of what the needs are of developing countries. So the GCF has uh, built into its charter, built into its DNA, that it will seek to finance 50-50 between mitigation and adaptation. There's some wrinkles on how that's measured, but on the whole, that is the point to take away, that it's 50% adaptation focus, 50% mitigation focus as a goal. The adaptation side of it is also has a target of half of that, so 25% of the total, to be focused on the least developed countries, so the poorest countries in the world, uh, as well as uh, small island developing states, so those that are at most risk in the short term uh, to climate impacts. Uh, that is a, a critical piece to how the GCF operates and how it decides on what type of projects it's going to fund. A third kind of key, very key piece uh, is that it has, it recognizes in its charter that if you are to be serious about climate change in developing countries, and you look at the gap between the funding that's needed and what can actually be done public with public money, uh, the only way you're going to fill that gap is by figuring out how to mobilize private sector finance. So to that end, there is a private sector facility, which is a standalone team. Um, that houses a set of expertises, expertise in the GCF that's designed to uh, work with the private sector to figure out that puzzle, right? So how it can best use the concessional money that GCF has uh, in order to unlock those flows, in order to crowd private sector funding into these developing countries and into investments that are low carbon uh, and even more difficult where you're producing you know, um, uh, resiliency impacts. Those are the, and in the paradigm shift I mentioned before, those are kind of the key unique things that make the GCF stand out relative to other sources of international climate finance. Now, how does it work? As I mentioned, there's a team uh, in Korea uh, that, uh, that look across the world and they work together with countries to kind of figure out what their needs are and what sort of projects they want to prioritize. The GCF itself does not provide funding directly for projects. Uh, it works through intermediaries that act as fiduciaries for the GCF. Those are called accredited entities. So these vary from uh, direct access entities, meaning entities that belong to a developing country in, in some way. So let's say it's a domestic development bank, as an, as an example, in a developing country, or, um, or a civil society organization that's set in a developing country, 
two on the other on the other end, large private sector players can become accredited, as well as you know all the all the large multilateral development banks at this point have become accredited. So the GCF uses that almost as a force multiplier to leverage their expertise and their relationships in these countries, and also so that the GCF can be at a manageable and efficient size in the way it uses its money through accredited entities. And then the accredited entities themselves, acting on behalf of the GCF, are the ones that manage the investments in the projects or the programs directly. Always, again, always uh, in collaboration with the local developing country, that's typically represented to a national designated authority. So that's an entity in the developing country that's assigned to be the counterpart of the GCF. No projects, GCF can do no projects in a developing country unless it has uh, the, the written approval uh, of those NDAs in those countries. And then the projects themselves, the GCF can use a variety of tools from grants to loans to guarantees to even uh, providing uh, direct equity. So as I mentioned, it works through accredited entities. I apologize, this list is a little bit out of date. Uh, this is maybe from two years ago or so, maybe a little more this slide. Uh, uh, today, currently, I believe there are 110 accredited entities. Uh, to become an accredited entity, I should say, it is, a, it is an intense process where you demonstrate um, that you have the, the ability to manage money in a way that's, um, 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 reliable and with good governance and also at the same time the ability to actually create the impacts uh, that are needed in these countries so this gives you a sense if you go to the website as i mentioned you'll you'll be able to get a more fuller view of who all the accredited entities are what their levels of risk that they can take are what's the size of the projects that they can take on and whether they're uh, focused on individual countries regions or have a broader international focus so how does it operate uh, in the most simplest terms? Um, countries uh, often working with uh, an accredited entity will, will uh, evaluate what their needs are, then they will uh, uh, generate a proposal um, that they believe meets the investment criteria of the GCF, and they'll submit that proposal through an accredited entity. The accredited entity ultimately will be the, uh, the intermediary, those proposals that undergo extensive due diligence and kind of back and forth negotiation uh, between the GCF staff in Korea and, and the uh, sponsors. Uh, it then goes through an independent review. That's that uh, ITAP panel that I mentioned early on. And then ultimately, if it kind of gets through the entire process, it will go to the board for final approval and with board approval uh, eventually into final contracts uh, and implementation. Uh, in this slide, just trying to capture some of the what does the GCF look at, right? So the GCF, uh, as others have mentioned, they understand the importance of crowding in additional finance. Uh, that's a big, that's a big uh, set of impact that it's looking for. It's the mobilization impact. They also uh, look at the climate rationale um, to make sure that everything that the GCF does is really has climate in the forefront. Uh, there could be other benefits and development benefits to a lot of the activity, but unlike other entities around the world that have various remits, the GCF really sees itself as having a sole principal remit of climate and uh, creating mitigation outcomes and, and adaptation outcomes in developing countries. So the climate rationale is, is taken very seriously. Uh, and again, the country driven approach, right? So does the country really want this? Do you have the letters in place? Has there been a stakeholder process? Uh, that demonstrates that this is really in the needs of the country and, and is part of what the country is hoping to accomplish. And then that gets measured against six investment criteria that are listed there. Um, and uh, the type of projects are also looked that the GCF looks at kind of fit in eight result areas. So if you look at those results areas and you look at the six investment criteria and taking into account the principles I've discussed, that kind of gives you a sense of the sort of stuff that the GCF uh, uh, funds. And again, I encourage you to uh, look at the website. You can get a sense uh, of the individual projects themselves. And if I have a, a couple minutes, which maybe I do, there are some misconceptions uh, about the GCF that I hear uh, often and even have seen it in, uh, in the paper record on a couple of occasions. So if you have these misconceptions, you're not alone. And, and maybe this is, since this is an education uh, moment, maybe you can clear some up. What is the 100 billion? Uh, you will often see the 100 billion conflated with the GCF. 
uh, and people will say it's a, it's a hundred billion dollar fund or that the GCF is supposed to get to a hundred billion. Uh, that's not accurate. Um, nowhere in, in, in the Triple C or Power Screen or, or anywhere is that established. But the GCF is part of the puzzle to get to the 100 billion. It's supposed to have a catalytic role in helping uh, get to the 100 billion target, both the 2020 target that existed pre Paris and other new targets out to 2020, 2015, 2025. But itself, it's not a $100 billion fund. It's not expected to be 100 billion. I'm sure they'd be happy to be a $100 billion fund. And, but that is not what's what is part of design. Second, it often mistakenly gets referred to as a UN entity. Uh, the GCF is a standalone entity with its own legal personality. It is not part of the UN system. Um, you know, the employees are not UN employees. Uh, they don't, you know, they don't have the same sort of uh, protections that UN employees have. It really is by design supposed to be independent or have some independence from the UN and the UN of Triple C process. Um, that's seen as a positive. Now, at the same time, it's quite related, right, to the UNF Triple C process. It takes guidance from the UNF Triple C process. It reports back to it, and it's a financial mechanism of the Paris Agreement. So the Paris Agreement recognizes the GCF as a critical tool to meeting the finance uh, goals. Uh, uh, but it isn't, as sometimes it's in, in common knowledge, people uh, believe are kind of a UN entity. And maybe the third uh, final misconception I hear often and, uh, and hopefully clear up is there, uh, sometimes when you talk, and this is more misconception in developing countries, uh, there is a sense that every country has an allocation in the GCF, a sense that, you know, let's say you are country X, that some percentage of that GCF money uh, should go to that country as some formal or informal allocation. That's not the case. Other international vehicles do operate on an allocation method. Uh, the GCF doesn't. And part of the reason is so that it can actually look across the globe and figure out where it can have the highest impact for dollars uh, inside the results areas that are listed here and subject to the investment criteria that are here. And with that, I'll end the day. Thank you, Rick, uh, for your great presentation and for clearing up those misconceptions. Um, I think it's always great to have things, um, especially in a session like this, which, like you said, educational, reaching people who may only just be hearing about the, the GCF. I think that was really helpful. Thank you for that. Um, reminder about questions. There are two ways you can ask questions, um, and we'll do our best to work them into our Q&A. The first is by following us online or on Twitter um, at EESI online. Um, you can also send us an email, ask, ASK at EESI.org. And we're already getting a couple. So thank you very much for that. We'll do our best to work them in. Our third panelist today is Joe Thwaites. He is an associate with the World Resources Institute Sustainable Finance Center. His work focuses on enhancing the climate finance ambition of developing developed countries supporting climate vulnerable countries in their engagement in international financial policy making and ensuring a just transition in the shift from fossil to clean energy. Joe, welcome. Um, I will turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dan. I'm just sharing my screen. I hope everyone can see that. Uh, so World Resources Institute is a global research institute and we work at the intersection of environment and development. Uh, we have offices all over the world and programs on cities, climate, energy, food, forests, oceans, and water, as well as centers that focus on business, economics, equity, and finance. And I'm, as Stan said, based in the finance uh, center. So today I'm going to look at, uh, zoom back out again after Rick's great uh, overview of, of the Green Climate Fund, to look at some of the, the international commitments that we've already heard a little bit about. Uh, look at how the US compares to, to other countries, um, and then the relevant appropriations accounts uh, that, that the US can use to meet its international uh, climate finance uh, pledges. Uh, but to start with, uh, I did want to look just based on the US government's own terms at how they uh, define uh, climate finance. And it's, it's relatively similar to the other definitions you've heard, but I think it's, it's, it's worth uh, showing here. Uh, essentially, it's about funding to help developing countries uh, reduce greenhouse gas emissions and or adapt to the impacts of climate change. And as others have also talked about, 
uh, why provide international climate finance? Uh, firstly, it's, it's about fulfilling international responsibilities. Uh, the US is the largest cumulative greenhouse gas emitter, um, and I'll discuss some of the, the commitments that, that the US has collectively signed up to uh, a little later. But, uh, but as others have said, climate finance is also a strategic investment in a cleaner and more resilient world. It enhances US credibility and influence uh, internationally. Put simply, it's, it's easier to get other countries on board when you're fulfilling your own obligations and showing a willingness to support them in taking on more ambitious action. And at a time when, when China is ramping up its overseas financing, including for, for climate, this is also a question of whether the US can maintain its global influence by providing attractive investment packages to developing countries to do more. Third, integrating climate considerations early on is good development practice, uh, ensuring better outcomes for the poorest and most vulnerable communities around the world. There's growing awareness of the many ways in which climate impacts can undermine development gains that we've seen over the last half century. And so making sure that interventions are designed to be resilient to a heating world and don't lock countries into unsustainable energy pathways can save money, certainly compared to a, a traditional development uh, finance approach uh, where you would, you would do that project and then maybe come back later to climate proof it. If you integ integrate climate up front, it can potentially save money. Fourth, climate funding boosts US export markets for clean technology. Uh, and out of the, the top 30 markets for US renewable energy exports, more than half of those are eligible to receive funding from the Green Climate Fund. And the fund is also directly supporting projects that have been implemented by US companies, uh, such as Acumen Fund and uh, Pegasus Capital Advisors. Those are, those are a couple of US-based entities that, that, uh, that are accredited to the GCF and, and, and Ricardo went over uh, a lot, lot more of those entities, but there are, there are certainly a handful of US-based uh, companies and NGOs that can access GCF funding and implement projects. And lastly, climate finance reduces the severity and costs of climate impacts for vulnerable countries and, and by shoring up unstable areas of the world, which, which if left unaddressed, they might present national security threats. So dealing with this up front can certainly, uh, can certainly be better for everyone involved, uh, uh, taking a preventative measure rather than having to react once, uh, once crises become uh, potentially even, even conflicts. Um, and, and climate finance can also address some of the root causes of, of migration. So I, I mentioned and others have already talked about international commitments that the US is part of, and, and the key one is, is the 100 billion uh, commitment uh, that, as Kate mentioned, was, was part of the Copenhagen Accord. And together with 22 other developed countries, uh, the US committed jointly to mobilizing $100 billion a year uh, in climate finance by 2020. Uh, and then in Paris, they, they agreed to continue that mobilization level through to 2025. Um, and again, as, as Ricardo, I think, very helpfully pointed out, that the commitment includes an acknowledgement that it can come from a wide variety of sources, public, private, bilateral, multilateral, and alternative sources. So it's not just about delivering all through the Green Climate Fund. It's great when, when money does go through the GCF, but there are plenty of other channels, uh, and they all, they all can play their role in, in fulfilling this goal. And then the other thing to say about this, just to sort of contextualize it, is, is that this, this is 100 billion a year is about 0.7% of the $15 trillion that developed countries announced in, in fiscal stimulus to respond to the pandemic. Um, so despite being a relatively modest uh, uh, amount in, in the grand scheme of global financial flows, progress towards the goal has not been going particularly well. I think it's fair to say a few weeks ago, the OECD released its latest assessment with figures up to 2019 that showed that countries were still about $20 billion short of that goal. And that was before the pandemic hit. And obviously there was a considerable disruption as Bella pointed out to global financial flows. So it's hard to say uh, where, where 2020 will land. That reporting will come in at the start of, of next year. Um, but it's widely expected that the goal was probably missed in 2020. And that doesn't provide the best opener for the, for the COP26 climate talks that will begin uh, next week. Um, the goal uh, was 100 billion annually, though, so developed countries can still deliver and ideally make up for any shortfall in 2020 and 2021. 
And, and to help identify what needs to be done at WRI, we recently released an analysis looking at how much each country was contributing as of 2018. The US was the third largest contributor in absolute terms, uh, behind Germany and Japan and about level with France. Um, but it's important to point out that the US economy is more than four times the size of Japan's, five times Germany's and seven times France's. So if you were to look at provision as a share of gross national income, the US actually ranked dead last at 0.03%. And if every country were to, to make the same effort relative to the size of their economies to reach the 100 billion goal, they'd need to provide at least 0.18% of their gross national income. And that's that's assuming that the 80 billion of the goal comes from public sources and, and the remaining 20 billion comes from private sources. But in terms of the, the public uh, commitments, that would that would equate to 0.18%. So the US would have a long way to go uh, there. There are other ways of, of assessing effort. Uh, the obligation to provide climate finances is rooted both in developed countries' larger share of cumulative greenhouse gas emissions, but also their, their greater relative wealth compared at least to most, uh, most uh, of the, the poorer countries. And uh, a number of researchers have produced uh, effort sharing formulae uh, that use uh, different kinds of objective indicators, including greenhouse gas emissions, GDP or gross national income, um, as well as population, their, their aid contributions uh, and, and, and other metrics. Um, and the the sort of the big picture takeaway here uh, is that the the U.S. fair share of the 100 billion climate finance effort um, would be between 40 and 47 percent of the total. Uh, so if if that total is is 80 billion in public finance, then uh, then the shortfall is at least 20 21 billion dollars per year from the U.S. alone. Um, and under every effort sharing approach, the US shortfall is more than double the combined shortfalls of all other countries. So there's there's quite a long way to go, at least according to, to some of these approaches, uh, to how, how, how one would divide up the effort. Um, the, the other dimension uh, to consider, and, and there's already been a lot of uh, discussion on this so far, which is great, is, is the, the, the need to, to scale up adaptation finance, which historically has, has not received as much attention as, as, as funding for mitigation or emissions uh, reductions. Um, and, uh, and, and this shows uh, how each country was performing in terms of their, their balance between adaptation, mitigation finance, and then cross-cutting finance in red is, is finance that tackles both objectives. Uh, so you can see that some countries are actually doing pretty well, uh, approaching or, or even exceeding 50% in, in adaptation, which is the yellow portion of the bar. But the US is, is around uh, a quarter of its funding uh, is, is going uh, to adaptation. Um, and, and developing countries have been asking for much more uh, for, to, to help them adapt to, to the increasingly severe climate impacts. Um, it's also in the Paris Agreement, there was a commitment to balance finance between mitigation and adaptation. And balance doesn't necessarily mean exactly 50-50, but I think it's, it's clear that a quarter is not, not particularly balanced. Uh, the Biden administration has heeded some of these calls and, and last month uh, pledged to increase US climate finance to $11.4 billion uh, per year by 2024. That's a quadrupling of the, the amount the Obama administration was providing. So a really significant increase. It would make the US the single largest uh, country contributing climate finance. Uh, and it will help get developed countries on track to meeting the $100 billion a year goal, although probably not for another couple of years uh, at, at best. Uh, but to be clear, the US won't be out on a limb here. Most of the countries will still be contributing more relative to the size of their economies. And, and, and as, as a comparison here, the European Union uh, collectively, uh, all the EU member states were already providing more than double what the US has pledged to do by 2024 in 2019. The Biden administration also committed to scaling up adaptation finance sixfold, which again is, is a really 
uh, significant effort and a really significant increase. But unfortunately, given the overall um, increase in, in, in total climate finance, which again is, is a good thing, um, but it has meant that that share of total climate finance will still be only around a quarter. So there could be more attention there to, to how to, to better scale up adaptation finance even more and potentially lessons to be learned from some of the multilateral funds that have integrated uh, uh, commitments on, on this. Uh, and when Biden made the pledge, he was very clear about the need to work with Congress to ensure it is delivered. And so I'm going to end by looking at the key appropriations accounts for international climate funding. And they all fall under the State and Foreign Operations Bill. Uh, these graphs show the last six fiscal years, plus, or sorry, the last five fiscal years, plus the President's budget request and the House and Senate versions of the FY22 bill. The Senate version was released on Monday, so this is very, very new new figures we're dealing with and i've split them into multilateral on the left and, and bilateral on the right so the multilateral accounts include a variety of international institutions the largest of which is the green climate fund as, as ricardo already discussed in, in a lot of detail the other funds include the global environment facility that has been around for over a quarter of a century the clean technology fund uh, of the climate investment funds that, that Kate mentioned in her introductory comments, uh, as well as the Montreal Protocol Multilateral Fund. And this helps developing countries to reduce ozone depleting chemicals. Many of those are potent greenhouse gases. So this is a case of being able to, to, to kill two birds with one stone, so to speak. And then it also includes the funding for the UN uh, Climate Convention and the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, uh, which is uh, which is uh, the, the, the uh, diplom diplomatic and the, uh, the scientific bodies of, of the UN, uh, respectively, uh, that are key, key to sort of tracking uh, global climate science and, and also providing the venue where, uh, where COP, COPs happen, um, where, where COP26 will, uh, will be hosted and, and providing that space for countries to come together and negotiate greater ambition on climate finance. On the bilateral side, there are three key accounts for adaptation, for renewable energy, and for sustainable landscapes. And this funding is primarily delivered through the US Agency for International Development and the State Department. And I'm sure Shashi will, will talk more about what USAID has been doing, doing with those allocations. As you see, sustainable landscapes has long been in, in the appropriations bills. Uh, and this, this concerns uh, forestry, uh, better land management, uh, things like that. But the other, the other two accounts, were first added by Congress in 2019. And this really reflected a concern that the Trump administration would not voluntarily fund these activities as the Obama administration had been doing. And it was an example of Congress using its power of the purse to ensure that no matter who is in the White House, more gets spent on, on climate. So that was really, really welcome. And as you'll see, the Biden administration across both multilateral and bilateral accounts significantly increased the amount it requested for climate finance to around 2.7 billion in total. Uh, the House and uh, Senate bills increased these further to 2.8 and 3.1 billion dollars, respectively. Um, and, uh, and as this is a positive signal ahead of COP26, that Congress is focused on how to deliver the 11.4 billion that Biden pledged by 2024. Uh, now things are going to move to the conference committee and, and, and congressional leadership will determine the final spending levels. But we do hope that, that these kind of levels uh, can, can, can hold in, in the final appropriations bill. One last thing to note is there are a few other channels of US climate finance not captured here, and that is funding through multilateral development banks and through the US Development Finance Corporation. And the reason for that is these appropriations go to their core funding for these institutions. Only a portion ultimately gets used for, for climate projects. So it's not possible to say up front how much exactly that will be. But for the MDBs in 2018, the US share was about $4 billion of their climate finance. And the DFC set a target of a third of its investments from FY23 onwards to go to climate projects. So uh, based on the DFC's current portfolio, that would equate to about 1.5 billion a year for climate uh, and may go up in, in, if DFC's overall portfolio expands. These channels will be very important to help the US meet its climate finance goals, but there is also a need to significantly increase appropriations and, and Congress has shown that it's focused on that. And, um, and so that's good, but it, but it certainly needs more effort and more, more ramping up in the coming years. Uh, but I just wanted to finish by saying, obviously, such support really does pay dividends by reducing the severity and cost of climate impacts for people 
uh, including extreme weather, ecosystem loss and societal instability. And that's both at home and abroad. Climate change is a global problem. So tackling it globally can also reap benefits back home. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Um, we were just commenting in our Slack channel that you have a very strong slide game. Um, those are excellent slides that put um, the appropriations in great context. Um, and along with Rick's excellent <coughs> slides explaining how the GCF is structured and decisions are made and Bella's slides about sort of how these dollars move and, and, and where they're focused. Um, really excellent presentation materials today. If anyone would like to go back and take a look at Joe's slides, Rick's slides or Bella's slides, of course, everything is available online at www.eesi.org. Um, it is now my privilege to introduce our fourth panelist of the day. Sashi Jayatiliki is a senior climate finance advisor with the U.S. Agency for International Development's Center for Energy, Environment, and Infrastructure. Sashi leads the agency's climate finance plan. Previously, she was a managing director with USAID's Private Sector Engagement Hub and provided technical and strategic advice to USAID missions. I think I said aid before, but USAID's missions on development finance, impact investing, and entrepreneurship. Sashi, thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, thank you so much for having me here, Dan. And um, I feel like I don't have very good slides game at all because I have no slides today, I'm sorry. But actually, I think my um, panelists ahead of me have really laid out the case quite well. And so I will try not to um, repeat any of what was said, but try to add on and complement with a little bit of a preview of what will be um, announced in uh, at COP26 in two weeks. So I'll just give you a sense of you know, what we've been doing for the last, I guess, uh, nine months as we've really tried to embrace the administration's um, objectives to elevate our work in climate um, across our entire uh, portfolio. And um, in the words of President Biden, you know, this is the number one issue facing humanity. And as uh, the principal US Foreign Assistance Agency, USAID is well positioned to support the administration's bold agenda and implement the Paris Agreement. We have really um, made climate a core priority for our entire agency. And we are currently working across every single bureau um, to look at how we can integrate climate goals across our portfolio. And so that speaks to the slide that, you know, was just presented by Joe on the earmarks that were allocated by Congress to ensure that there is consistent programming in three specific areas, adaptation, renewable energy, and sustainable landscapes. But we also want to see all of our work in economic growth, in governance, and agriculture, also contributing to climate um, goals. And so part of the exercise we've been undergoing over the summer is talking to key stakeholders like those on the call here today and in Congress to find out how we can position ourselves to really help um, prevent worst case climate scenarios. Currently, uh, we have programming in about 45 countries totaling about $360 million. That's taking those earmarks that uh, Joe showed earlier. But as I said, we want it to be um, a collective effort moving forward. And we wanna do this in an alliance with both our global partners in the North and South um, and ensure that we're doing this in a way that allows ownership to our partners in um, the developing world. Um, for us, addressing climate change, we believe can cut economic costs through more efficient use of energy, natural resources, and natural resources, and eventually reduce the cost um, related to more frequent climate-related disasters. For that, for that reason, tackling the climate crisis can actually provide enormous economic benefits for Americans, providing new jobs, economic competitiveness, and ensuring that communities and workers can benefit from the transition to a new clean energy economy. For us, developing international markets for clean technologies and climate-friendly solutions will also promote opportunities for Americans. Um, foreign assistance for climate solutions, as mentioned earlier um, by my prior panelists, will minimize the negative impacts that drive displacement and migration, such as food and water insecurity. 
And so what do we think is needed? As you all know, President Biden expressed his intention to increase public climate finance to developing countries to around $11.4 billion. We hope to work closely with Congress to meet these goals. But it's important to remember that, you know, finance doesn't mean just raising money. It also actually means solving problems. And so we are looking at ways to mobilize resources and direct funding to solutions on the ground that um, actually have impact and drive change uh, and are accessible to climate vulnerable communities and countries. Uh, we want to use our investments to scale up our prior work in renewable energy, transform agriculture to make food systems more climate resilient, and update infrastructure needs to reduce the risk of future disasters. In some ways, um, we see this as expanding markets for our own job opportunities here, and the failure to act globally will have serious consequences here locally. Um, at COP26, we'll be launching a new climate strategy for public comment. Um, this strategy is based on our history and best practices of working in climate mitigation and adaptation, um, but also pursuing structural and systems changes in order to meet the goals of net zero emissions by mid-century and to build resilience in climate vulnerable countries. We hope to work with the most vulnerable to reduce climate risks, including local farmers, as well as working with national governments and everyone in between um, to ensure the food, water, health and infrastructure systems are resilient to the impacts of a changing climate. How will we do this? Um, as the lead federal agency for international dis disaster assistance, we also want to work to improve disaster preparedness in the face of climate hazards and hope that these investments will save lives and money. For us, every dollar we invest in climate adaptation and preparedness over the next decade will yield at least three times the return in net benefits. And to confront these complex challenges, the new climate strategy is quite ambitious and employs a whole of energy a whole of agency approach um, to tackle climate change. And that means in doing our own part in terms of internal reforce, reforms to reduce emissions from our operations and safeguard our facilities from climate risk. We're also embedding in our strategy principles of equity, inclusion, and locally led development to ensure that the voices that hopefully need and need to be heard are able to be heard, as well as holding ourselves accountable for those results by announcing them um, to the world at COP26. We want our partners to work with us hand in hand to ensure that what we are doing is meeting best practices and owned by our local country counterparts. And we also wanna complement and reinforce the work of our interagency partners, including the State Department, the DFC and MCC. Um, we are taking advantage of our field presence to leverage the expertise of other agencies like the Department of Energy and Transportation, but also to hopefully work with American science and innovation and transfer those learnings to the countries we work in. How will we integrate climate risk management across all the sectors of our work? Um, we're guiding our, our agency through climate considerations and priorities across development and humanitarian assistance. And that means identifying ways that every single sector can contribute to climate change mitigation and adaptation results and helping communities to prepare both through our missions in, in the field, as well as through our Bureau of Counterparts in Washington. While keeping in mind that um, climate change does disproportionately impact vulnerable communities, especially indigenous peoples, women and girls and youth, we are trying very carefully to ensure and integrate gender equity and climate justice considerations into all our climate change programming. These are new additions to our work in climate change from um, the prior uh, 10 years. In addition, as you saw that we are a part of the um, White House's first ever international climate finance plan, and as my prior, as Bella had shared, you know, climate finance is not just public finance, it's also working to mobilize the trillions that are sitting on the sidelines um, of finance that can be invested in the countries we work in. So we are trying to build on our experience globally of mobilizing private finance to reduce the risks involved of getting private sector partnerships in the countries we work in 
and holding our private sector partners to higher development standards, environmental safeguards, and social safeguards. Although blended finance is not new to the agency, it does need to be structured in a way that can um, be used to support climate outcome and such as, and as well as building on some of the new learnings and solutions in adaptation and nature-based solutions. Um, we are working closely with our partners at the DFC for this to see where is that risk spectrum that perhaps is uh, too high for the DFC, too high for multilateral climate um, funds, and perhaps um, too complicated for, for, for the, the funds that are already out there. Can USAID come in and support early stage design? Can we support enabling conditions? And specifically, can we build capacity in these countries to be able to access these funds? We hope to leverage an average of $20 mobilized for every dollar of USAID funding put in for private to mobilizing private finance. And we hope to bring in multiple stakeholders in these discussions. We have the convening power to bring colleagues from the private sector, US government agencies, and partner governments to attract and deploy the necessary financing and achieve transformational scale. We also see communities that have investable projects, but without the ability to communicate to investors in the language that they need. And we see businesses aware of the climate challenge, but straining to identify the positive impact that's needed to perhaps attract um, investors and financial returns. We want to bridge this gap and see capital flow to meet the needs of, of our green recovery. We hope to support additional tools, technology, methodologies, and platforms that help the business and multi-stakeholder communities to speak the same language and unlock those trillions of dollars of financing needed for climate solutions. Four specific ways we hope to do this is by building the pipeline of credible businesses, assisting partner countries to access climate finance and meet requirements for the GCF and other funds, structuring private financial vehicles to leverage public funds for greater development impact, and supporting the financing of underserved sectors and underserved communities through multiple risk management tools. We have history of already mobilizing finance through this type of work um, over four years of, uh, of work of building conditions for investment. And that's historically mobilized over 28 billion according to our standard indicators. Uh, and that's such as programs such as Power Africa and Asia Edge. But we really see an opportunity with Fortune 500 companies coming to us now with these new carbon neutral commitments and commitments to really use science-based emission targets. So we feel that we the time is now to leverage those commitments and further the taxpayer dollar in our climate work. We'll build on our experience by partnering with firms such as Starbucks um, and in Cargill to improve farmer productivity and also to mitigate the risks of these investors and connect them to ensure benefits reach local communities. Just one example of how we've done that in the past and how we hope to continue doing that is the Althalia Biodiversity Fund that helped in investors and private enterprises to support conservation in the Amazon. We were able to work with the local um, network of, of private sector partners and bring a fund that had never been registered in Brazil before and utilize protection through our grant support to then catalyze investment from the private equity world. And now we see many other funds going to, to look at the Amazon for potential investments in value chains that are compatible with both forest conservation, um, sustainable agriculture, and create local jobs. I'll leave it at that for now, but thank you. Thank you, Sashi. That was an excellent presentation, a perfect way um, to conclude the presentation portion of our briefing today, and we'll transition into some Q&A. So thank you very much. And also, Sashi, I imagine you're pretty busy right now, about two weeks away or so from the start of COP26. So Thank you very much for taking time out of your very busy day to join us and share some of uh, USAID's perspective on all this. Thank you. Um, let me um, ask our panelists and Kate to turn on their videos and we'll go right into the Q&A. So um, I'm going to uh, begin and Kate, we'll start with you because you sort of were, we haven't heard from you for a while. So we'll start with you and then we'll go through the panel sort of in the order um, of, of presentations. Um, I'd like to, 
um, sort of start with the idea that I kind of alluded to in my intro, the idea of quantity of financing and quality of financing. And the $100 billion goal has come up several times today, it tends to be the headline, but in fact, it's not just about how many hundreds of billions of dollars, it's also about um, sort of how accessible that financing is, the, the quality of it. And so, Kate, I'd love to hear from you, and then we'll go to Bella and, and Rick and, and so forth. Um, sort of what steps are being taken um, to ensure that the amount of financing that we're mobilizing for climate change solutions is matched by the quality so that, um, and, and what steps should we be taking in advance, in, in addition to the ones that we already have to improve the, the quality of the financing going forward? Great, thank you. And I mean, it's such an important question because as you say, it isn't just about kind of numbers um, and, you know, it's very easy to, uh, to focus on the 100 billion, whereas, you know, that, that was a commitment, but we know that isn't the totality of what's needed. Um, and, and actually, we all know that it's the, the real intent of this, um, of climate finance, in both the narrow sense that we've been talking about a bit today, but, you know, kind of that public climate finance that we report to the OECD and the UNFCCC, but also in its much, much broader um, state as well in terms of all of those flows of finance uh, into uh, the transition to net zero and supporting adaptation resilience all of that is is hugely important and we need to really think about the impact of that on the ground so in terms of the uh, the quantity yes it's important and sort of tracking that and being able to talk about it understanding those much wider flows as well that Bella and others have talked about as well but absolutely the the quality of, of what happened is important and certainly we've really focused on that as kind of COP presidency coming in and and held a number of sessions with countries to try and understand this and to, to promote it and to um, see what we can do and I guess there's a number of particular issues that I might just point towards um, very briefly so when we think about quality what we've been thinking about is um, I guess of four different things particularly so first of all is is the balance um, and joe touched on this between adaptation and mitigation and making sure that we are doing both and adaptation has traditionally not been funded to the extent that mitigation has so we need to make sure that we are that we are doing both um across that as well you know often we'll talk about finance for things like yeah nature as well and forests which which sits within that um the second really important thing is access to that finance. It's all very well having having the numbers, but you need to make sure that the, you know that it can be accessed and actually spent because that's where you're going to have the impact. Um, and you know, Rick and others have talked about you know actually what does that mean in terms of funds like the GCF, but also in terms of you know both the multilateral funding, but also the bilateral funding, and how can we work with countries to make sure uh, that they can get the kind of funding that they need at the right time and in the right way. So access is absolutely critical um, and one of the really key things that sits behind that is is the right kind of support and technical assistance as well so that countries can really tap into that finance both the public stuff but also those larger flows of private finance too and technical assistance is is critical here to get the regulatory environment right um third point is thinking again about the kind of the kinds of finance and here you know we, we talk about things like grants or concessional finance and making sure again that we're targeting those in the right ways to the right kinds of projects and getting that right for countries and different kinds of countries different kinds of projects uh, will need different kinds of um, inputs as well so there's not a one size fits all in terms of this and the fourth thing which we look at is the effectiveness um, and the impacts that you get and kind of monitoring that and understanding what we're doing again so we can all learn and, and get this better over time as well both whether as kind of uh, donor countries or as recipient countries um, if we understand what is effective what countries need then we can respond to that so hopefully that just gives you a bit of an overview as to how we are thinking about that quality issue thanks thanks and bella I'd love to hear if you have additional thoughts on that, and then we'll go to Rick and then Joe and then Sashi. Sure, yeah. I mean, I think Kate really covered it in a lot of ways. I mean, the UK has done really an exceptional job of uh, understanding and assessing value for money. They're really well known for it. So uh, always good to listen to them on the topic of quality. 
Um, I think just to underline what she said, you know, about context specificity. So barriers to investment are very context specific. They are technology specific. They are region specific. Um, they are even locality specific. So really making sure you do the analysis to understand what is it that's preventing investment and then being able to say, okay, these are the tools these are the instruments, you know, where we can really affect changes is critical. Yeah. Um, I, I guess turning to me here. Um, quantity is not the same as uh, impact. Uh, and that is one of the issues with the 100 billion and, and sometimes it ends up being a, a distraction to the to the problem of to the actual problem of climate on the planet you know it, it, stri it strikes me watching the presentation bella did earlier where she's showing the percentage of climate flows how much of it was going to mitigation the vast majority how much of that was going to renewable energy the vast majority of that well we all know renewable energy in the last you know 10 years in terms of the cost of it and the price of it is, is totally collapsed right so uh, so you end up in this kind of question that what's more important, the amount of dollars that are going or the amount of clean megawatts that are being put in place. Right? And, and that is a tension that sometimes exists around the hundred billion number. However, at the same time, we know it's politically important, it's diplomatically important to hit the hundred billion. And it is a sign of progress if more money is flowing into projects and opportunities that are low climate um, and that are, are resilient. Uh, so the key is, as I think like the other speaker said, is how do you use it in a way that's most effective, particularly when we talk about public dollars, right? And that's going to be four activities that cannot be funded in, another, in any other way. Um, and then four activities that are addressing some of the barriers to the money that you need to get in that space, which is going to be the, you know, the private flows. And that's everything from pipeline development to building up local partners that can actually build the ecosystem you need in, that, in those countries, access highly highly important the question of access um, so you know that's what governments have improved on i think in the last uh, years and figuring out how best to use those dollars and sometimes it means it's less dollars better use get better impacts and you know that's not as easy of a story to sell uh in the context of the of 100 billion but it is the reality joe thanks yeah i mean i think the the, one of the graphs that, that Bella presented in, of, from the new uh, landscape, I think, showed, you know, obviously there's there's a need for both more and better, but we're still way, way short, globally speaking, uh, of the, the investment levels we need, whether from public or private sources. And so figuring out how, how you get more of that is, is, is going to be key. Um, I totally agree with with what Kate said about about adaptation, improving access as well, uh, including access for developing country institutions, and that's one of the things that the GCF and the Adaptation Fund do particularly well on is that they directly accredit uh, 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 developing country uh, uh, ministries, NGOs, businesses, and and they can go straight to to those funds without having to go through an international intermediary like a UN agency or a multilateral development bank. Um, the other thing I think the, the sort of a key topic in terms of quality is about the financial instruments. And um, what we've seen in the last few years is that the share of, of the amount of grant finance has really stagnated. Uh, loans have increased. Equity finance has also not really increased particularly. And, and what, what we hear often from, from private sector is that they're more interested in equity, in guarantees, in, in, in more innovative financial instruments. And then what we hear from, from public sector and from, from uh, adaptation needs is more grant finance. And so figuring out how to, how to improve the financial instrument allocation, uh, because, because a lot of the time the loans aren't necessarily the best suited to the needs. Uh, so, so looking at that. And then the other thing is, 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 yeah, in terms of effectiveness, how do you catalyze that broader shift? And one of the big challenges has been over the last few years that the that private finance mobilization hasn't taken off in the ways that were hoped for. In 2016, developed countries put forward a roadmap that projected that of the 100 billion, 33 billion would be coming from private sources. And as of 2019, it was it was less than 15 billion, so less than half of what what was hoped for. So I think there's more reflection needed on 
on what needs to happen with public funding to do better at mobilizing private investment, because right now it isn't delivering as, as was hoped for. Sashi, happy to give you the last word on this. Yeah, I know we have a minute left. I mean, I think this is one of the best questions because at the end of the day, you, you can't throw money at the problem. You have to measure your results. And I will say um, we were taking that very seriously. I was working on lots of different Excel sheets to measure you know, historical performance with our monitoring and evaluation um, indicators that I referenced and what we need to do to improve that and track our performance if and when we have an increased budget. And so I think it's really critical that our partners work with us to be able to track our performance in every dollar used and ensure that it is reaching the impact that we, we hope it, it should. Thank you for that. Um, we are just about out of time. It says 2.30, but um, I will sort of take moderator's prerogative and ask the group, uh, optional, um, any final words? Um, we're getting close to COP26. Um, invite anyone to chime in with a key message um, that you would like to leave our audience with before we wrap up the session um, about international climate finance. And you can take yourself off mute and speak up if you have something, otherwise we'll, we'll end. I guess I feel duty bound here. Um in terms of yeah the COP26 messaging and uh, my final thought would be, so our, our Prime Minister has talked about his um, goals for COP. I mean, we've kind of got more formal objectives around mitigation, adaptation, finance and collaboration. So finance is right in there. Our Prime Minister has also talked about coal, cars, cash and trees. Um, and again, you see that finance is right in the middle of what needs, what brings this all together, what is gonna make it work. And we know we need finance for the, the huge transition that um, every country and actually every institution needs to go through um, in order to uh, deliver on the commitments made in Paris. So I guess my final thing is that we know that every dollar spent, every financial decision needs to take climate into account. And that's countries, companies, communities, institutions, everything needs to now focus around that. For us, a lot of that is the 100 billion, but we're also doing a lot of work too with the private finance flows too. So we need everyone to come together on this agenda. Thank you. Bella, you took yourself off mute. I'm gonna interpret that as having something to say. So I'm happy to give you the last word today. Oh, sure. I, I feel like we should leave off with Kate, but um, I will just say that, you know, international climate finance really plays a crucial role in so many countries to help finance their climate action. We really need to scale it up. We need to deploy it more effectively. We need to use all the tools that we have in our toolbox to do that. And so really, um, and very much encouraged by this panel and this session. And thank you so much for all of your attention. Well, thank you very much. Um, thank you, Kate, Bella, Rick, Joe, and Sashi. I have been riveted. Um, by the last 92 minutes. Um, I've learned a great deal um, from all of you and um, special bonus points, Sashi, for even bringing up nature-based solutions, which is something we care a lot about here at ESI as well. And I just wanted to also just say that across all of your presentations, I really, really appreciate the amount of emphasis that you all put on adaptation as well as um, your comments on mitigation. It's something that's critically important and something that, um, again, we think a lot about at ESI. So thank you very much for that. Um, and again, I know it's a busy time, but a couple of weeks before COP26, so thanks for joining us today. Um, I would like to also thank um, those who've made this briefing series possible, our honorary co-sponsor, the British Embassy Washington, uh, and our great partner, the Henry M. Jackson Foundation. Thank you uh, to both organizations for your generous support. The briefing series will resume with the negotiations, what's on the table this Friday, I hope you'll join us for the full slate of congressional education programming related to COP26. You can visit www.eesi.org and RSVP for the entire series. If you've missed something, never worry. Everything is archived. Presentation materials, the webcast, it's all archived online on our website. So you can catch up or go back and revisit um, any of the presentations so far. And while you visit us online, you really ought to sign up for our bi-weekly newsletter, Climate Change Solutions comes out every other Tuesday. The next issue comes out this coming Tuesday. So 
uh, yeah, this coming Tuesday. Um, and also we have our new daily newsletter. It's going to be exclusively available during COP26, the Glasgow Dispatch. So please sign up for that as well. Um, I will conclude by thanking everyone on Team ESI who made today's briefing possible and the briefing series possible. Thanks to Dan O'Brien, Henri Laporte, Emma Johnson, Anna McGinn, Amber Todorov, and Savannah Bertrand. Thanks also to our wonderful interns, Isabella, Valerie, and Roshni, for all of the hard work um, that they do as well for us this fall semester. Um, the screen or the slide you're seeing right now is a survey slide. Um, if you have two minutes and you are willing to take our survey, uh, we value your input and feedback. Um, I know we didn't get to a, a whole lot of questions today, so apologies for that. But if you have questions, please feel free to send them in. Um, you can also share them in the survey. We read every response and we take it very seriously. If you have any comments about the audio quality, video quality, topics, presentations, um, accessibility, anything that you'd like to share with us, please take a moment to uh, complete our survey. We will go ahead and wrap. Sorry for going five minutes over, but I think it was worth it. Uh, really excellent presentations today. I wish everyone a great rest of your Wednesday. Thank you for joining us, and I hope to see you back on Friday.